Stability and durability have been mentioned multiple times as a challenge and priority research area in this meeting. So I hope to convince throughout the talk um, that photocatalysis uh, with the protective coating um, as a stabilization technique, um, I, uh, we think that this photocatalysis would be a versatile means for achieving a decarbonized economy at scale, especially by locally uh, utilizing natural resources. So my name is Shu Hu, I'm at Yale Chemical Engineering. I'm also affiliated with the Energy Science Institute at the Yale West Campus. So how does our work fit uh, in the puzzle? Uh, we think that we would like to use the semiconductor photovoltaic materials to leverage the photovoltaic manufacturing at a scale to achieve directly the light-driven chemical production. Uh, that includes the fuels uh, from sunlight and also community chemicals um, uh, from sunlight. Uh, so we think that, of course, electrifying the society is necessary. PV plays an important role, and so is the batteries, flow batteries. Uh, we should do as much as possible. But there are occasions such as the cold winter in the Northeast region, including Boston, that benefits from the burning fuels for PV. So chemical production at scale is really directly related to this long duration storage. And therefore, at a fundamental level, we work at the intersect of the semiconductor physics and a heterogeneous catalysis to co-optimize efficiency and stability. So along these lines, and we have been working on two simple chemistry, one is the water splitting, the other one is to uh, produce hydrogen peroxide and hydrogen uh, from oxygen in the air and water and sunlight together. So here, first of all, we think hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide are energy carriers. And beside that, there is in growing infrastructures for utilizing hydrogen to produce carbonized fuels or upgrading commodity chemistry. So we think that these are important intermediates uh, to work on. All right, so a major contribution for the materials for photochemistry that we think we contribute is the stabilization coatings. And uh, stability and durability is pretty much very important uh, because along the way of cost reduction, it, um, if you can really improve the stability from tens of minutes all the way to thousands of hours, I think it ultimately really determines the cost of the chemical production. So, so far we have shown that we have stabilized entire class of technologically important semiconductors, extended the operational operation conditions from the base pH 14 to uh, zero, uh, pH zero acid. And we show that the conformal technique can code on various nanostructured semiconductors, including nanowires and missile scale wires. And uh, essentially previously, when the semiconductor, all these semiconductors, they photo corrode within tens of minutes to hours. And now these uh, have been extended to beyond thousands of hours nowadays and becoming a new durability metric. So all these advances really are made available by inserting a stabilization coating at the semiconductor liquid junctions. And the fundamental understanding of such complex interfaces is something I'd like to talk about today. So we utilize this uh, technique called atomic layer deposition. Um, in, in fact, um, we have also developed new type of coatings by introducing additional extrinsic energy states from the transition metals and into the atomic layer deposition process. So the reason we why use this is actually we, we, we got inspirations from nature. We, get, uh, we see various colorful natural gemstones with different colors. And in order to really make those discrete and localized energy states become conductive and being able to transport charge, we really need to squeeze all of them and into a very thin coating layer, really essentially increasing their concentration by a hundred times to a thousand times. So in doing so, these compositions are becoming far away from thermodynamic equilibrium and the typical ceramic synthesis wouldn't be really available. So that's why we choose this uh, kinetics-driven uh, um, atomic layer deposition technique to really grow coatings of 10 atomic percent of uh, extrinsic dopants and achieve tunable energy levels. So this is an example. Previously, I showed you the um, structure of the coating, and this is the electronic energy level of the coating. 
And essentially, uh, the caveat here is that we show we need to match the electronic energy states that are tunable inside this coating to the respective energy band structures of the underlying semiconductor materials that are protected so that there will be efficient charge separation at this, what we call heterojunction interfaces. And, and furthermore, the accumulated charges that can actually transport through these, what we call intermediate band to, through this coating to the surface attached the catalyst and drive catalysis. And we think this is quite general. We have shown in a number of work and, is, and, and nowadays, almost uh, every single uh, technological important semiconductor can find a suitable coating to match up with its energy band. And this is the, would be one example. You see this um, uh, photoelectrochemical curve for water oxidation. Okay, so, so with that, um, to put in the, the scale perspective, of course, ALD, you can do it in a row to row manufacturing fashion. But even so, to obtain 100 kilogram of hydrogen for, let's say, uh, one residential courtyard or one hydrogen summit charge, one would really need a football field to run about at least 12% solar to hydrogen efficiency every day for seven years to make up the um, energy cost. So on the one hand, where the photoelectrochemical panels or particle-based uh, photocatalysts we really need to deploy them at the agricultural scale. On the other hand, the industrialized uh, uh, fluidized reactor, we call it CSTR in chemical engineering, they can output hydrogen, uh, for example, even using a simple catalytic cracking uh, reaction, they can output the hydrogen at this scale very easily. So how do we really bridge the gap of technology between these emerging ones and really the existing ones in the chemical production industry? Thinking about we can deploy the LED technology in a particle-based reactor, really thanks to the recent advantage of the advancement in the electricity to light conversion. So these conversions can essentially achieve over 96%. So we can essentially thinking about not just a solar-based energy conversion, but really want to design a particle-based photoreactor which operates at a room temperature and matches the production throughput as we demand with the light power input. And you can essentially improve it with a hundred times or thousand times of the solar illumination for that. So the question is, how do we move from here to there? So recently, our group have transitioned from working on the photoelectrochemical devices um, to working on photocatalysis, really not just for energy storage, but really for meeting the versatile chemical production needs with the local resources. So here, we think that there are tremendous opportunities to actually work on photocatalysts. Here, we define photocatalysis really as the concurrent or co-evolution of reductive and oxidative reactions along the same particle liquid interface. So essentially, conventionally, the photoelectrochemistry you have driving one half reactions. And for photocatalysis, due to the charge neutrality, you have to simultaneously drive reductive and oxidative reactions. Of course, that creates lots of complexity, but I think that's what we think that's uh, where the, the science is really interesting. So, so far, the photoelectrodes, including PEC and the PVEs, the photovoltaic directly connected wires to electrolyzer, have achieved over 19% solar fuel conversion efficiency. That's about maybe 75% to 80% of the theoretical maximum. I'll show you on that. But um, for the photocatalyst, the, the best performing one uh, recently is uh, only less than 1%, and that is already counting the materials like strontium titanate have uh, utilized 100% of the quantum efficiency absorbed the UV light, but um, still um, there's a big gap there. So how do we really understand the charge separation at the local uh, proximity? And how do we understand the selectivity, not just for the product selectivity, but for the electron transfer selectivity for favoring the hydrogen evolution or reductive reaction, but actually avoiding the unnecessary redox, uh, re-reduction uh, re of the redox couple or what we call back electron transfer. So how do we do that? 
So with this small numbers, we see huge uh, opportunities, but this really doesn't prevent us from really gaining more because the theory, theoretical limit efficiency limits that uh, we understand so far can be comparable to the uh, uh, efficiency levels that are achieved by photoelectro-based panel system. So for example, uh, for a uh, co-evolution of hydrogen oxygen uh, water splitting, uh, you can essentially in the realistic materials achieving uh, over 15% solar to hydrogen efficiency just by using the right band gap of high quantum yield material. And if we use the earth abundant material with the less of, uh, quantum yield, and then you can still achieve over 5%. So the kind of the efficiency number that we are getting now uh, really needs to be uh, further improved. But for this kind of uh, co-evolution system, of course, there are safety concerns, hydrogen and oxygen mixed together, um, but you can really just uh, separate them. But separation of the hydrogen and oxygen do have energy penalty, about 10% of the actual Gibbs free energy cost. So if you consider that, uh, we actually really favor this tandem system, which you can utilize uh, two photo absorbers in a photocatalytic reactor. And there are actually two compartments. One compartment produces hydrogen and they oxidize the redox mediators. And the redox mediator actually eventually go to the oxygen compartment where they regenerate the redox mediator and evolve oxygen. So the efficiency limit for this kind of system is still actually comparable to the 25%. So we can actually achieve that if we achieve a good understanding of how the photocatalysis work. And furthermore, we think that this kind of system can be adapted to what, we, uh, what mimics the nature of um, taking the carbon dioxide out of air and performing the carbon capture during the, the night uh, cycles of the diurnal solar cycles and perform the carbon dioxide utilization in a form of bicarbonates and produce the carbonaceous compounds. Okay, so we decide to understand what, uh, how does this work? And actually, this is a question that not does um, that does not get uh, asked uh, quite a lot um, in this field. So so far, the advancement there are quite a bit, but mostly are by trial and error. So a, if we try to think about this as a thought experiment. We put the coatings over a particle and trying to understand what the band structure would be and what the diagram would be. And of course you would very easy, uh, very typically end up with a U-shaped band diagram. We call it a symmetric band bending. But this kind of symmetric band bending doesn't have any favor for either electrons or whole charges to both go to the surfaces. So there's no selectivity for that. So the fundamental research question is how does particles work and what does the size plays a role for that? If the size is very small and the particle is typically depleted and uh, in, in that case, it is also flat band and how does the charge separation operate for that case? So we decided to took a different pathway in the field. Um, we decide to take model semiconductors like silicon, gallium arsenide, gallium aluminum phosphide, and, and you develop them into a particle-based photoelectrodes and use the uh, uh, photoelectrochemical cells and scanning probe techniques to probe their semiconductor parameters, such as quasi-fermi levels, band structures, electrical field, and trying to understand how the charge separation actually works. And we recently showed that um, there are actual mutual dependence between the charge separation, the energetics and the kinetics at the complex particle liquid interfaces. And this is quite different from the photoelectrochemistry where you think the uh, band bending, band structure would be just a one dimensional. We would think that there are uh, spatially varying band structures along the liquid junction. And furthermore, the design principle that is that a small asymmetric band energetics along the liquid interface would be very sensitively to drive efficient charge separation. And in doing so, we recognize that a small change of the redox charge transfer selectivity 
or the kinetics of the charge transfer to varying redox couples really can change the energetics and in return actually affects the charge separation performance. So all these factors actually looking like a interlock gear that affecting each other and eventually reach to a steady state. So that's how we understand. So we apply this to multiple semiconductor systems. I'm going to show you how we did it, but this is a summary. Uh, we essentially achieved using a 2.3 electron volt band gap CDS cadmium sulfide particle system, we achieve about 5.9% solar to hydrogen efficiency, two to one hydrogen to oxygen ratio. For the gallium phosphide, a conventional 3.5 semiconductors, and we can achieve 9.4% solar to hydrogen efficiency. So what we discover is that we can utilize this general stabilization technique for photocatalysis. So we start with the CDS particulate panel and we code AL decodings over it. And then we uh, selectively photo deposit um, rhodium co-catalyst for hydrogen evolution. And I will talk about this core shell structure later for how um, that affects um, our understanding. So here we get this structure and we think that where the rhodium is, um, the electrons got accumulated to there and where the rest of the coating are, that's TL2, the whole charge uh, goes to accumulate that the coatings. And this entire system actually, the rate determining step is charge separation, not even catalysis. And once we achieve good charge separation, the, uh, the activity of the photocatalyst increase dramatically. So we show that this can um, operate um, uh, for 150 hours and even with a 300, uh, sorry, even with a three nanometer coating, uh, the surfaces of the CDS doesn't get affected a lot. So we have the XPS results to show that uh, after 150 hours of long-term stability testing, the oxides of the sulfur sold minimum signal and um, of course, we observe some of the um, activity losses over time, but we think that the photoabsorber morphology didn't get affected. The only change would be a small losses of the chromium oxide modification layer over the rhodium catalyst. And if we really deposit those, those rhodium, uh, chromium oxide on rhodium, we get the efficiency back, okay. So with that, we were able to build a uh, solar fuel particle-based photoreactor. Um, we used the reversible sulfide, polysulfide redox mediators um, to, uh, to achieve the uh, two compartment separated hydrogen and oxygen evolution. In fact, uh, this really mimics the diurnal solar cycle where you can evolve hydrogen during the daytime and during the nighttime, you can actually regenerate your redox mediator and actually produce oxygen for the next day. So the caveat here is that we so far use one panel, it achieved 1.7%, but if we achieve three panels, um, stacking them on top of each other, uh, the solar to hydrogen of this reactor can reach 5.9%. Um, but so far we understand um, this is uh, based on the PVE cell for the oxygen uh, regeneration. So in the future, we'd like to build a, a fully photocatalytic system where both the particles will produce hydrogen and oxygen uh, in two compartments. So that's something we're working on. Okay, so let me switch gears and talk a little bit about um, what we think is happening. So we have two hypotheses. The first one is really about how to achieve, uh, improve the charge separation. And this is, as I said, is done by this uh, photo deposit rhodium co-catalyst that is also modified by a chromium oxide layer. So only by doing so, the hydrogen evolution rate got increased by a lot. But without the chromium oxide layer, we do see hydrogen evolution. And that is actually in the presence of a reversible redox mediator. But we think that the, there's so much of the recombination going on in the form of a re-reduction of the polysulfide. So the whole overall system, the hydrogen evolution rate is not that high. 
So that's our preliminary understanding. But the second one we understand is that um, there are mutually dependent energetics and selectivity at the solid liquid interface. Of course, we want to have the accumulations of electrons at the rhodium sites and at the accumulations of whole charges at the elsewhere. So essentially where the uh, co-catalyst is defines the charge separation geometry. But we also recognize that the energetics of this rhodium plays a key role in the charge separation. Because first of all, the, the, the photo absorber itself is very lightly doped. The charge separation is driven by a combination of diffusion and drift under the electrical field. So that is a completely different regime compared to the photoelectrochemistry. So because of that, a small changes of the catalyst potential or a change of the catalyst, the local barrier height, and that changes the local electrical field, that is sufficiently to change drastically the charge separation efficiency. I'm showing it here. So we're able to understand this in the context of the semiconductor liquid junction. But the classic liquid junction theory doesn't really account for more than one redox mediators that are presenting in the liquid. So therefore, we understand this and we go back to the original thoughts of developing this theory and applying the detailed balance and microscopic reversibility principle uh, to this multi-junction liquid junction theory. And we show that um, it's, it is actually the kinetics of the trap transfer to the different redox couple that affects the energetics. And if we cannot really suppress the unwanted uh, uh, oxygen reduction or redox mediator reduction. We adventurously really push the redox mediate, to, sorry, to push the band edge positions down to the middle of the band gap um, so that the charge separation is not efficient. Only by controlling the uh, kinetics of the charge transfer and really making almost all the electrons go to reducing the hydrogen, we can pin the energy level of the, uh, the, the co-catalyst to where it is close to the small um, barrier height. And here we can really achieve the charge separation. Okay, I know this is a bit of uh, detail, but let me just uh, summarize here. So uh, we think that the achieving the efficiency in the photocatalyst really required a renewed thinking, okay? So here we show the three-dimensional uh, picture of a solid-liquid interface. And we draw a line along the interface, not the typical one that goes into the box. And we show that there are an electrical field that is uh, arranged laterally along here. And because of that, this small electrical field between the reductive and oxidative sites is sufficiently to drive charge separation. And we have to really keep it, um, uh, this uh, arrangement like this. Or well, otherwise, if we couldn't really uh, control the selectivity here, we were able, to, um, in that case, the energetics of the co-catalyst will make the uh, energetics becoming um, uh, symmetric again. And therefore, there will be lots of uh, recombination issues for that. Okay, so I, I said this. Uh, um, I said this example, and uh, in the later later slides, I'm going to show you three examples that will apply this technique to various systems. Um, so first of all, I apply this to gallium indium phosphide uh, photoelectrode, and we show that it's the same situation. That um, with this co-catalyst uh, configuration, we're able to achieve high quantum efficiency. And uh, that is basically due to the asymmetric energetics. We can measure that the small change of the barrier height, actually only less than 0.5 volts, is sufficient to drive the 80% quantum yield for this system. And that is quite exciting to us because we think that uh, we can actually model this and the modeling result agree with our quantum efficiency measurement pretty well. So, we're able to apply that to a new system. Um, so in this case, we could think about really inputting a bicarbonate solution as the uh, input and in situ produce CO2 
as the intermediate and the co-catalyst at the reductive site can reduce the CO2 to CO. So I'll show you how uh, we think about this. Okay, so we apply this uh, gallium indium phosphide coating and silver co-catalyst system, and uh, we put it into a bicarbonate solution. So I want to draw your attention to two curves. Um, one is this blue curve at the, at the low pH, near neutral pH, pH seven, there are some dissolved CO2 in there, of course. And uh, so you can start to produce some CO in the beginning, but of course, later on, uh, you, you got depleted of CO, so there's no um, additional production of CO. And for the green curve, of course, if you use this redox tuple, which is a benzoquinone redox tuple, you produce protons, and here you pr continuously producing protons and then continuously liberate the CO2 locally. So both curves make sense. What is interesting is that for a pH9 bicarbonate solution, and without a proton generating redox mediator, uh, as this gray curve, you don't get any CO. But with the proton generating redox mediator, and you get CO. So essentially, the, we think the CO is coming from the CO2 that is in situ generated. But what is slightly different from the electrochemical bicarbonate utilization uh, is that there is a pH gradient across the reductive and oxidative site. And essentially, the reductive site is more basic and while the oxidative site is more acidic. So there is a pH gradient, but the reduction site where the CO2 actually is, fav um, is needed is actually not to be favored to be present there because it's basic and it's like to react with the, the OH minus and the becoming carbonate or bicarbonate. So what we think it happens is under this non-equilibrium conditions, there is a, a synergistic photocatalysis transport process happening where the proton is regener uh, locally generated and producing CO2, but the CO2 generates CO2 gradually trans transport to the reductive site. And this local transport happens so fast that the CO2 doesn't have enough time to be reabsorbed as a carbonate in the solution and therefore getting utilized. So this is a one idea of really tweaking the microenvironment of the photocatalyst that produces the CO um, instead of uh, hydrogen evolution. So we think that we could potentially apply this bicarbonate idea or even seawater and directly feed it to a photocatalytic reactor and we can produce various kinds of uh, products and eventually becoming value-added chemicals. Whereas in comparison to a modular approach and you have to go through a complicated dialysis or um, a calcifying process to get a CO2 and then run it to a CO2 electrolyte and get the product. So we're quite excited about this idea as well. Okay, in the last few minutes, I, I want to be quick and really just talk about our um, idea of uh, producing hydrogen, which is a gas, and hydrogen peroxide, which is a liquid chemical at the same time, while achieving a safe separation of the both products. Another benefit for doing hydrogen and hydrogen peroxide is that the cell potential is actually higher, 50% higher than the water splitting potential. So we can actually store more energy per electron transfer, which is quite nice. And as we know, hydrogen peroxide it's an important commodity chemical. Of course, during the COVID period, it's been quite useful. But furthermore, it's been used for uh, energy carriers um, for propelling, but also can be considered as a long duration energy storage media because it doesn't really require pressurization or cryogenic temperatures to store them. The only precaution is just don't put iron in there or avoid UV radiation, so that's um, actually quite doable. So therefore, we think that this has a potential to be a green medium that sits at the unique position of the energy water nexus. So we look at the challenge here. The challenge is really a selective two electron water oxidation to produce hydrogen peroxide. And the caveat here is really we want to avoid the over oxidation of the hydrogen peroxide to make oxygen. And as you can see, there are so many pathways 
to really not making hydrogen peroxide and eventually making oxygen, but particularly the radical based uh, a, um, pathway that easily can disproportionate hydrogen peroxide. So we think the photocatalysis or the related energetics control uh, have the opportunity to achieve selectivity because during the photocatalysis, the energetics of the band is actually pinned to the liquid and therefore you don't have to really move it around. It is fixed there. So that could potentially control the selectivity. If you want to increase the rate, just turn on the light. Okay. So we start with this multifunctional coatings with the idea that the coating could produce peroxide and where the co-catalyst can produce hydrogen. So we start to look at this uh, titanium manganese oxide. It's a manganese alloy titanium oxide. And we design this material for the very purpose of selectively producing hydrogen peroxide. And I just show you the result here at the, um, the typical manganese oxide is start to produce uh, do water oxidation to make oxygen right away. But for the manganese alloy TL2, the potential turns, the, the current turns on for peroxide production, uh, it's actually above 1.8 uh, volts, that which is the thermodynamic potential for uh, hydrogen peroxide and water couple. So we, we think our uh, finding for this material is quite unique is because Many of the reports shows uh, various um, activity and selectivity, but here we show that the at, right at the thermodynamic potential, um, this catalyst turns on, and their uh, Faraday efficiency reached to over ninety five percent. So we think that this is attributed to this intermediate band that we create using manganese. So by aligning the manganese intermediate band with the respective redox um, intermediates for hydrogen peroxide production, we we're able to, able to control the selectivity. Okay, so uh, for the interest of time, I'm going to skip the conclusions and I'd like to make acknowledgements to several people in my group, uh, Dr. Zhao and Pan for developing the co-catalyst and the Rito who is a fourth year graduate student continually working on the natural resource utilization and gene for the hydrogen peroxide. And I'd like to thank my collaborators here and also thank the funding agencies, uh, DOE, as well as the SILOG Award for, from the Research Corporation and Sloan Foundation. And, and thanks so much for your attention. I'd like to take any questions. Well, thank you for a, a, a really fascinating talk involving uh, you know, some a lot of chemistry, solid state physics, uh, bands, et cetera. This is a, a, a really uh, complex uh, uh, complex process here, complex topic. Uh, and it's, it's uh, interesting to see that you're looking at um, uh, scaling, um, uh, scaling results here. So again, uh, feel free to uh, put the uh, questions in the, um, uh, the, the Q and A uh, below or in, in the chat. Uh, so it sounds like these um, uh, these films play multiple roles uh, for for protection, for catalysis, and for um, uh, and and for um, you know changing some of the reaction time scales to avoid back reactions. It's a, it's a remarkable set of systems. Uh, question is is um, uh, how important to scaling up uh, will will some of these rare elements like um, like rhodium uh, be? Yeah, yeah, the rhodium, of course, it's a uh, uh, platinum group metals always is a problem. The, um, so we use a rhodium, platinum, and even gold, we think we just use them for a model system study. Uh, we know they are good hydrogen evolution catalysts, so we want just want to make sure that uh, they are not a really determining step. But um, if you look at the, so now that we have built a model, and we think the, um, rate limiting steps for the um, photocatalysis is not the catalysis. Well, if you think about it, it's a small particle, it doesn't absorb a whole lot of light. And so if even you achieve very high quantum yield, um, the charge flux at per active site, is actually quite small compared to uh, electrolyzer systems. So this is a golden opportunity actually to start utilizing earth abundant uh, electrocatalysts um, for this kind of purposes. 
And you can have lots of opportunities to design the morphology of the particles and the light conditions and all that things. The reactor engineering aspects actually uh, to minimize the burden on the co-catalyst. So we think there's a lot of opportunities. Thank you. Interesting. Okay, thank you. I see Professor Wee, uh, you have a question? Yeah. Yes, uh, so thank you for a very exciting talk. Uh, on your last part of uh, mixed titanium manganese oxide uh, to produce uh, hydrogen peroxide, uh, what valence is the manganese and, and how stable because I, titanium dioxide is, is pretty stable, but, but does manganese uh, dissolve uh, at all? And, and also why, why, I mean, I see that you, you know, you, you suppressed oxygen gas evolution and, and what, what exactly is the reason for that uh, in, in this case? Thanks, thanks uh, Professor Lee. And it's again, great to be here. Um, I share your concern and the, yeah, I have the same concern. I mean, when I when I look at these coatings, I said, okay, of course, I know manganese is going to d dissolve um, at a pretty high potential. So you can make soluble manganese three plus, uh, sorry, uh, seven plus um, oxidation states if you drive it over 1.8 versus Rg. So that's a very vulnerable potential to work at, uh, especially for the uh, pure or polycrystalline manganese oxide. Uh, well, we think it's a, a combination of these. So the, the manganese oxide in our manganese alloy TL2 is uh, like a cluster, it's nanoscale, like few nanometer, two nanometer, three nanometer clusters, they're embedded in TL2. So we think that in the matrix effect of TL2 actually helps protect it from dissolution. So, and, and furthermore, a, we think the, it is the, really the subsurface manganese oxide. Uh, that is helping with the peroxide production. So essentially, the um, we, we think the active site is subsurface. It's really not really the manganese at the surface, but that is enough to provide the trap tunneling and make it happen. So we have some um, uh, theory work with uh, Victor Batista and uh, understanding that. So combining that, we think that the manganese probably at the very surface already leached out, but that's a very small amount. And it is actually the, the TL2 surface, rich TL2 rich surface with the manganese below it that actually uh, can make the process. So 